big box is like really hungry for brands like ours. Or if you look at what Mr. Beast has done with Feastables or, or the prime brand with Logan Paul and KSI, like they're realizing that getting like Gen Z in the store is pretty much only going to happen that way. Like they're not clamoring to go to Walmart unless they can go grab, you know, the latest flavor of prime or whatever. My thesis, I guess, on how these creator businesses work in the early days is you build a community, you build an audience, you can sustain yourself from that, but you need to run it really lean because you, you can't float like five, $100,000 a year salaries on that. You know, you'd be underwater. So you run it really lean and you can develop some sort of product or service off of that. That is what helps to grow the business. But you also have basically a negative CAC because you're getting paid to, to produce the thing that's selling the product, right? Unlike, let's say, a traditional direct-to-consumer business, maybe they spend 20, 30% of revenue on acquisition and they have zero organic traffic. They want to be lean teams and small and very, very profitable cash flowing businesses, or they want to be very big and trying to destroy the market and transform it. But in the middle, I think you get eaten alive by both sides of the equation. Up until 2021, when we touched 7.3-ish million in revenue, all of that was done with zero dollars on paid acquisition. At what point were you like, I think this can be a eight, nine figure a year revenue type of business? Was there like a point where you're like, I'm going all in? So 2021, I was just getting emails cold from Bessemer partners and all these different people. And I'm like, delete, 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 delete. Something about the churn email really stood out because I admired the companies they had built. So we, we do the Series A round and then we're like, okay, well, you were running this company on a skeleton crew because going back to that, these businesses want to be small or really big. So I was in the small phase. We could actually attack this industry and make it a better experience for everyone, especially people like me who I didn't grow up gardening. It's given me so much to my life. And I was like, man, if, if, if I could do that for more people, that would be amazing. Welcome to The Peel, where we explore the world's greatest startup stories. I'm your host, Turner Novak, founder of Banana Capital the most epic venture capital firm. Today I'm sitting down with Kevin Espiritu, the founder and CEO of Epic Gardening. Epic is by multiple measures, one of the largest brands in gardening on the planet. What started as a blog in 2013 has since evolved into a gardening empire that spans the entire internet across YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook, multiple popular gardening products and properties, and one of the largest wholesale distributors of seeds to independent gardening centers in the US. According to external sources, Epic did $27 million in revenue in 2022, and Kevin mentions he wants to take Epic to nine figures. We'll go back to the very beginning, including creating a Reddit community to drive initial traffic to the blog, and his very first acquisition, a blog run by a venture capitalist in India for $1,000. We discussed YouTube as a platform, the metagame around it, and the creator ecosystem more broadly. We talked through the history of YouTube, break down how creator-led business models work, why they have negative CAC, and the reason they must be either a very small or very large. Kevin runs one of the most interesting creator-driven businesses I've ever come across, and he shares how he launches new products off of his content, non-intuitive ways products can influence your cost structure, and his biggest mistakes going from a purely media-based model to now selling his own products. At the end of 2021, Epic raised a $17.5 million Series A from the Churning Group. Kevin talks through why he raised from outside investors as a YouTube creator, his approach to hiring, and he takes us inside how he acquires and launches new products, including the large seed wholesaler in the US, Botanical Interests. If you like media-driven businesses, Kevin and Epic Gardening is one of the more interesting stories you'll ever come across. And I learned a lot that I'm gonna take away in how I do my own content. I hope you enjoy. Let's jump in after a quick word from Atio. There's a world where your CRM is powerful, easily configured, and deeply intuitive. Atio makes it a reality. Atio is a radically new CRM built specifically for the new era of companies. It's flexible, easily configures your unique data structures, and works for any go-to-market motion from self-serve to sales-led. Atio automatically enriches your contacts, syncs your emails and calendar, lets you create powerful reports, and quickly build Zapier-style automations. The next era of companies deserves more than a one-size-fits-all CRM with outdated UX. Someone recently described Atio to me as the linear of CRMs, which, if you're in the know, that's high praise. Join companies like OpenAI, Replicate, Eleven Labs, and more. Try Atio instantly at atio.com. That's A T T I O.com. Or tap the link in the show notes and scale your company to the next level. Thank you, Atio. Now, let's talk to Kevin about Epic Gardening. Kevin, thanks for coming on the show. How's it going? 
Good, man. Good, man. How are you? I'm good. Excited to talk about, I think we're going to hit on three main things. YouTube, your business, Epic Gardening, and then talk a little angel investing. So first question, what is going on on YouTube right now? Can you kind of talk us through maybe where we're at today? Maybe it's helpful to give us some history or some context. Uh, just kind of get us in the mindset of the platform YouTube, the metagame. You've had some good content around that lately. So I think it's kind of a good place to start. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's a deep world and you could go, you could go so far back in history here. And I think everyone defines it in their own way because when you started is kind of the era that you were in. So if you think about YouTube founded like 2004, 2005, that's era one, right? I mean, it's it's like the most you part of YouTube, Charlie bit my finger, some like, it's back when you could go viral across actually the whole internet at the same time. And then you just go on like Ellen or something if, if you were Charlie, right? <laughs> that was, yeah, that was the end state. Yeah, that was that was it. Like you'd, you'd make the talk show rounds and that was actually the goal. And these days, obviously, it's just not the case. So, you know, back then it was called the classic, classic era. Everyone's sort of just figuring it out. There's no business established behind it. Very, very early YouTubers were sort of just doing it because and that was it. And then when I when I started YouTube it was 2013 and I started it in a very cringe way, but so did everyone. Right. Like when you start your first video is probably always going to be your worst. And my first video was one that I made on a hydroponic gardening system. It's like something called deep water culture, very nerdy. But instead of recording a video, what I did is I designed uh, 10 layers in Adobe Photoshop of like a graphic and slowly unhid the layers as I voiced over the video describing how this system is built. And so it's effectively a PowerPoint presentation, but I didn't do it that way for some reason, even though PowerPoint was well in existence by then. And so, you know, that was kind of the era I would call it of just sort of figuring things out. Like the, the meta game, if we want to talk about that, was kind of being developed at the time. There was different formats that were starting to become known, you know, like <clears throat> the vlogging format or, you know, the reviews sort of thing or, or reactions. I feel like lyric videos were fairly popular, maybe harder to monetize, but that was a big piece near impossible to monetize back then but but definitely a format for sure uh, and then you know you get into the later teen 20 teens you get into people building real businesses behind youtube so like the first one i can think of that's in a space similar to mine would be michelle fan and ipsy i think it was like a makeup kit or something like that but that was like true youtube passionate audience directly to a makeup brand or a skin i think it was makeup and she kind of did tutorials, right? Like taught you how to apply and then started recommending products. And then I think she created her own line. Then she just created her own line. Yeah. And that's that's pretty much the arc that every product-based YouTuber will go through, it seems like. I mean, certainly for me, it was the same kind of way. But yeah, she'd do like how to do cat eyes and then which is the best mascara for cat eyes. I'm probably like butchering what makeup is actually used for what purpose, but you get the point. And then all of a sudden, it doesn't take too much of a genius leap to go, well, why am I recommending Maybelline for 5% when I could just make Michelle fans make up for, you know, in, in cosmetics, at least probably like 80% margins or something crazy like that. And so now I guess we're, what you're seeing at the time of this recording, at least is, is sort of a, a bit of a changing of the guard. I would say some of the bigger YouTubers are tapping out or they're stepping back. You, know, you look at a guy like Matt Pat, who I would say is one of the better YouTubers ever to exist. And when I say better, I mean in the Taylor Swift sense, not in like the, you know, esoteric band that only you like sense. It's like mass appeal, huge audience. He's done it, you know, three, four, five times on different channels, different niches, different categories. And he's kind of saying like, look, there's only so much I can do here. I've kind of tapped it out and I'm giving my channels effectively to my, my lead writers to run. So he's stepping back as a host, you know? So it's an interesting, dynamic, multiple channels. I mean, I, I think I might have an idea, but I'm curious your take, like, why would someone have a bunch of channels? It's just, it's weird, right? It does. So it's a big, it's sort of a, been a big debate over the last however many years, five ish years or so is as you expand. So I'll just take, take us for example, Epic Gardening is the only channel that I had until 2020. Uh, and so obviously you're trying to put all your effort on growing one channel because of that compounding effect, right? The more views, the more subscribers, the more subscribers, the more views, that whole sort of game. Uh, and then in 2020, my reason for creating a new one is I had purchased a house and I wanted to talk about stuff like 
canning, preserving, baking, these sorts of things that fundamentally no one signed up for by subscribing to Epic Gardening. And so I decided to create a channel called Epic Homesteading, which at the time had no videos. And I just said, hey, look, something new is coming. I posted it on Epic Gardening. And, and we I think we had like 35,000 subscribers before a video even came out, which is in a way awesome and in another way painful because it took me like years to get to 10,000 on my first channel. So it's funny how that compounding wheel works. But the reason, I think it's because the terminology is kind of wrong. Like on a on a YouTube channel, you might think you could have many shows on one channel, right? Because if you if you make a TV analogy, that's sort of how it works. But it doesn't really seem to work quite that way. It, it seems better to have, you know, take MatPat. And if you don't know who MatPat is, his biggest channel is Game Theory. He has one called Film Theory, Style Theory, and Food Theory. So it's the theory universe is sort of what he's doing there. And obviously, if you sign up for Game Theory, you, you probably might be interested in movies. But if that's all he starts putting out, you're like, yo, bro, like, what are you doing? You know? And similarly with Food and Style. So he took his his essence and he brought it to four different categories which to date i actually don't know that i've seen anyone do it at that level because those are very different like style and food is very different from film and, and gaming but he's he's gotten many many millions of subscribers on all of those and so the the channel is almost like a container for a broad topic that you could have formats underneath but you shouldn't really this is just my personal opinion you shouldn't really go too too far afield of that you might as well just make another channel because I think the dirty secret of YouTube is like the sub count, the subscriber count effectively doesn't really matter. It's almost like TikTok works these days where you're going to get pushed a video that you're going to watch, whether you're subscribed to it or not. So if you subscribe to 10 channels in woodworking and never watch a woodworking video, your home feed is not going to have woodworking on it. So it basically means you aren't subscribed to those channels in a true sense. And I actually know. So the, the head of YouTube's algorithm he's mentioned before offhand he would never do it but he's like if i could i would just remove subs from youtube because they don't really matter in, in a fundamental sense but obviously that's part of like the culture of youtube is to get your email subscribers you'd never do it but it's very interesting i mean it's 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 way different than i think someone from the outside would imagine yeah i kind of think about it as a it's like accumulated social capital or accumulated how many times you've gone viral like essentially I mean, that's how it's like for me on Twitter. Like if you go to my Twitter, I don't know the exact number. It's like 164,000 followers, I think. And most of my tweets don't get that many views, but some of them get millions and like tens of millions. So it kind of doesn't matter. Like people are not going to see my tweet if it's not something that the platform knows people will watch. Dude, I kind of think that like the follower count mechanic is sort of like a 2005 to 2018 era phenomenon that will kind of go like we'll look back in the, this age of the internet and go like yeah why does that actually matter how how many followers someone has because you're totally right like think about it follower accounts do not decrease ever so you can only accumulate them you can't prune them like you could prune an email list or an sms list so if i could i would i would actually love to prune it down if if it actually meant that i it works like an email list would like your send percentage your open percentage i just it just doesn't work that way. I feel like uh, notifications, like if you turn notifications on for someone's post, like you get a push, that's almost like a more qualified version of a, of a subscriber or follower because those will probably see them no matter what the algorithm does. But that's pretty small. I mean, I, I, I would assume all people who follow someone maybe less than 1% have push notifications on. Maybe it depends who they are, but... You know, I wonder, I, I don't know ours offhand. I want to say... Might be a hundred thousand people have them on because you, when you publish a video, it'll tell you how many pushes it sent on YouTube, and so you can get a sense for it. I, I'm pretty sure I, I haven't looked in a while, but you're totally right. And then there's the abuse of that mechanic, right? Because like the, the whole phrase like marketers ruin everything, right? So if you if you treat your channel too much like that, it, it's not good to 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 push all the time to everyone unless it's bangers only. And few channels run that way. Like Mr. Beast is a great example of someone who runs that way. Uh, but if you're not one like that, like we're definitely not a channel like that, then sometimes we'll just turn them off or, you know, just more selective. Oh, so you will not let people subscribe to push notifications or you will not trigger the notification if you post? Yeah, sometimes we won't push it. For, for us, I always feel like I'm kind of on an island in YouTube because we're such a seasonal business. 
Uh, gardening is ex exceptionally seasonal in the literal sense, right? Spring, summer, fall. In winter, what are you doing? You're just kind of chilling. Yeah, what are you doing right now? You just you just hanging out? Well, I'm in San Diego, so I can still grow, but the audience can't most of the time. And so there's either like they're either escapistly watching us in their, you know, cottage in in the snow or they're just not watching us, right? But yeah, no, for us like uh, the example I always bring up is let's say I want to do a video on how to grow corn from seed. That first of all, that video takes a while to to film. I have to literally grow the whole plant and film every stage. So the production on it's quite, quite long. How long does that take? Corn is probably like 90 days, 90, 120 days or so. And then you got to remember like every sort of phase change of the plant. Okay, what do I do here? What do I do here? And you got to remember like what you're wearing and all that kind of stuff. You've got to wear the same clothes. Okay. That's why That's why I mostly just wear this hat and some sort of generic shirt because... <laughs> Pretty easy, yeah. Yeah, it's simple. Anyways, so when that video comes out, when it's done, the corn's done, right? So I can start editing that video when the corn is done. But when the corn's done, everyone else's corn would be done. So if I put that video out at that time, it's gonna do absolute garbage. And that's what happened. So we put this video out sometime late July, which is like well past when you could grow corn. And no surprise, it gets a 10 out of 10. And on YouTube, what I'm saying there with 10 out of 10 is they'll rank your videos as as how well they did in, in relation to the last 10 that you did. So a 10 out of 10 is the worst. It's the 10th best video out of the last 10. Uh, and then they'll show you based on the time since release, how many views it's accumulated relative to those 10. And so this corn one is what I call a deep 10. So not only was it worse than the last 10, it was about half of the views. So it was like way below. Of the ninth one? Yeah, of the ninth one, exactly. That's sad, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> Dude, I was so, I was legitimately, that day I was like, are you serious, man? I just spent like four months growing this goddamn corn uh, and no one's watching this video. And then I go, you know what? It's just the season. And so the video is out. It looks terrible, but I know in my heart that it's a good video. I know it's a good video on growing corn. So I just waited a year. I think it's at like 700,000 views now. People just needed to search for it again, right? And so that's one of the ways that we play our channel that's very different than I would say, I don't know, like a, a tech reviewer or something like that. So you think of it more as like SEO keywords, long tail over a long period of time, almost like a, like a blog post versus there's some people that are like, hit space, you're probably gonna get most of the views pretty quickly and like it's stale, like iPhone 13 review, like no one's watching those videos anymore. Is that a, is that kind of how you approach it? Well, it's both, right? So ideally you could be a channel that doesn't have to rely on one strategy or the other. So for us, like I can do, let's say I haven't done a video on how to grow lettuce from seed or mistakes in growing lettuce. Those are great search-based videos. And then we know there's a few formats that work really well for like the recommended sidebar. So we'll do like gardeners react to bad TikTok plant advice or something like that. And I just feel like a funny thumbnail where he's like, ah. Yeah, and you're just like, ah, you know? Um, no, literally it's just the, those those sort of kind of cringy thumbnails, but they're funny, you know, they're sort of funny. But you no, know, we'll do those videos and those videos basically go viral. I, I usually use like a baseball terminology. So like they're usually doubles. You know, sometimes they're grand slams and then sometimes they get repicked up in recommendations, but you're not searching for that ever. And so you're sort of really relying on the algorithmic sensibility to, to push that one. So there's basically search based videos and suggested videos, um, suggested being ones like you would just simply stumble upon. Right. I mean, I'm sure you've been on YouTube and you've seen there's there's thumbnails I can even think of right now that I've seen 74 times and I've just never clicked it. And then eventually the 75th time, I'm like, God damn, YouTube, you got me like I'm in, you know, I need I, I need to figure out what how these Chinese women overthrew, you know, this small town or something like that. Uh, and I'm like, OK, fine, I'll learn, you know. So, yeah, we, we try to have a mix of both. But certainly in our field, we're in education, right? Gardening education, like there's there's a lot of plants and there's a lot of searching around those topics. Yeah. OK, so I guess if it's to level set. What is kind of the state of Epa Gardening as a business? Like, what are you allowed to share in terms of like, I know that YouTube is a big component, but then you also have like blog, the website where you do a lot of transactions, you guys sell stuff. Can you give us like a high level on what all it is and how it all works? Yeah, sure. So, so Epic started with a blog because uh, I started it. I mean, it, technically, I guess in 2013, went full time on it 2016. But yeah, it really was a blog. I was 
I was building websites, I was marketing local businesses, and that was like my calling card was was just having this blog saying like, look, like I can I can build websites, like here's my little hobby about gardening. And that would close these clients that I was working with back in the day. So today, uh, Epic, I believe we're like the second or third most trafficked blog in gardening in the world. It, it just depends on whatever stats you want to believe at the time, but it's top five, let's call it. And then on, on I think every social platform, maybe with the exception of Facebook, we're, we're the largest account about gardening. In terms of fall, the fake followers and fake subscribers? In terms of the fake followers, but frankly, I think probably also in terms of, of views, I think. I mean, it's, it's really hard to say. Nevertheless, like if in aggregate, there's no one that has a bigger following across all platforms than we do about specifically gardening. Um, but the crazy part is like that, that is cool. And that's up until 2019, that's like what I was all about. But once we started offering products to our audience, I mean, that's really what the business has become is much like Michelle Fan and Ipsy, like we mentioned, the the offering and developing of products to to the audience. So now, you know, we're we're multiple tens of millions in revenue. We've we've made some acquisitions. We own a seed company, actually the first seed company I ever started growing back in the day, which is kind of crazy. We we bought that company from the founders a year and a half ago now. Some smaller acquisitions as well in the earlier days that we could talk about, but yeah, I mean we're we're pretty large now. I mean we're teams it, it, like in the fifty to eighty range, multiple tens of millions in revenue. We're in retail um, and we're online, and we have a bunch of different product lines. So it's it's grown a lot in the last year and a half or so. Wow, I did not realize you were also in retail too. So you have it's is it Epic Gardening branded seeds or? Did you keep the name of the seed company? Or? The, the seed company is called Botanical Interests. Beautiful packets. It's the, if you ever go into a nursery and you just look for the ones with art on them and not pictures, that's us. Uh, so these very beautifully drawn botanical illustrations. So the brand's amazing. So we, we would never destroy the brand like that. Um, but in acquiring Botanical Interests, we are now effectively in like 4,500 stores in the country. And so part of the thesis on the acquisition, there's, there's many reasons to do it, but one of them was, well, we have a distribution network now, and we know that we develop products on the Epic side of the business that work and people buy direct to consumer. And we have that data like hard and cold. So why don't we just offer that to our, our wholesale network and expand the business that way, which is very hard to build on your own in this industry because you either go big box, which is its own you know, challenge, or you go the way that Botanical went, which is independent nurseries and garden centers, which is like kind of the soul of our industry. And that's a very hard thing to do because you're literally dealing with one to three chain stores across the whole country. So the scale of that is very hard to kind of crack and they already cracked it. And so that was one of the reasons that we decided to acquire it. Yeah, it's probably a pretty big advantage to have all those set up, launch a new product, plug it across the network, however many however many locations. Did you know how many of those independent or very small kind of seed botanical uh, shops there are? I would say there, there's th there's definitely thousands of nurseries and garden centers. It's in the thousands for sure. All, all of our 4,500, like we have a line of like a, a smaller selection of pet related seeds that we offer it through Petco, for example. So we were in like 18 stores last year. We're in 200 something stores this year. Hopefully we're, we're doing a full rollout next year. So that's some percentage of our store mix, but I love to focus on the small, the small nurseries because that's kind of where the, the soul of the market is. Yeah. I feel like in terms of just your, your positioning, you know, the kind of leverage and power you have over the market, you know, it's probably tricky selling to like a Walmart. You can just be like, give us the lowest price possible. And if not, we'll just go somewhere else. Yeah. And it's, you know, it, it, it's tough because you have a brand that's been beloved by independents. And if you go and shop that to a Walmart or something, you're sort of slapping your customers in the face, right? I mean, that's who they're getting eaten alive by. And so Big Box is always knocking at the door because I think, frankly, Big Box is like really hungry for brands like ours. Or if you look at what Mr. Beast has done with Feastables or, or the Prime brand with Logan Paul and KSI, like they're realizing that, that, getting like Gen Z in the store is pretty much only going to happen that way. Like they're not clamoring to go to Walmart unless they can go grab a, you know, the latest flavor of prime or whatever. So yeah, they're, they're always kind of looking, but you know, never say never, I guess, but we certainly wouldn't do it with our seed brand or there's, there's just, there's certain categories we just would never do. Yeah, I want to dig a little bit more into the early days of Epic Gardening. We kind of, we kind of really quickly skipped over it, but we definitely get a little deeper on it, but you had a really interesting point on some of these kind of, I don't know, I guess YouTube first or YouTube creator led 
brands. You kind of mentioned a couple that, that have been pretty successful, Logan Paul, Mr. Beast. How do you kind of see that, I guess, side of the market evolving? Like, are we going to see thousands of brands led by YouTubers? Or do you think it will probably be maybe only like the top, you know, 10, 50, 100? Just like, how do you kind of see that evolving over time? I think if you look at a Mr. Beast or, or a KSI or Logan Paul, they're pure media creators, like they're pure entertainment creators. And so there's no category you can really put them in because they're all kind of trying to be the biggest in their category, which is media in general. And so, yeah, just be be huge. Right. And and so if you look at I can't know, you know, Jimmy's mind, but I would imagine he was thinking something similar to I lose a lot of money on my main channel videos because he has this maniacal obsession to perfect videos and his budget always kind of goes over his ad revenue. So he's upside down on his main channel. His side channels, I don't know if he's super focused on those right now. So it's those used to kind of pay the bills of the main channel before Feastables existed, is my understanding at least. And he basically had to ask himself, how do I create a business off of YouTube that is perfectly aligned with the YouTube audience that I have, which is the biggest on earth? And so you kind of have to go to a commodity product that every human being likes and, and tr just try to improve upon that. So then that's why you see chocolate. That's why you see, you know, cosmetics. You see energy drinks. I mean, I think chocolate and energy drinks are probably one of the best examples because we all, to some degree, have that. Maybe coffee, Emma, Emma Chamberlain with Chamberlain Coffee. Yeah, I mean, actually, she's another really good example because it's not like she's about coffee on her, her YouTube channel. Uh, whereas someone like myself or there's a really big coffee YouTuber named James Hoffman, I don't think he's done product, but he could, right? So if, if, if I come in with a product line, it, it, it's about gardening, it's for gardeners, and I'm really plugging into the existing infrastructure of that market. Whereas it seems like what a, a Jimmy or KSI are doing are basically using their, their media leverage to sort of force themselves to exist in, in Walmart and big box, and they're going crazy scale distribution. So to kind of get back around to your question, I think that in the media side of things, there's probably a few that will dominate because that's just kind of the nature of markets, right? Uh, but in in places like like where I play, probably similar, but there's going to be a lot of people who can do okay. I call it the mid tier creator that'll just have a, a, a really solid direct to consumer business, maybe uh, where they they kind of like outsource a lot of it, like it's they're shipping via three PL, their manufacturer ships directly to three PL. They don't really you know do much besides kind of put their branding on it. And that'll probably work for quite some time. But I do think like coming at it with this more aggressive approach, like more of a, I would call like a true sort of business approach will will lead towards like winner takes all ish type of things. And is it probably some function of like if you watch a Mr. Beast video, I don't I don't I don't know if I if we should say it's low intent, but like you're probably not watching it in the mindset of I'm getting ready to buy his product. Maybe that's wrong. But I guess with yours, you're probably like, I want a garden. I I'm starting this journey. There's like a 80% chance I'm going to buy some products to start doing whatever I searched. So it's almost like maybe you have fewer views, obviously, but much higher conversion rate. And your AOVs are also higher. Like, I guess I'm thinking chocolate bars from Mr. Beast, 10 bucks, whatever they cost, versus, you know, a starter kit to start your garden or start the season, like probably a couple hundred bucks in seeds at least. All the tools, if you're getting started, like. No, yeah, I mean, the first product I ever sold, and we can talk about that story if you want, is a metal raised garden bed. And the cheapest one I think I sold at the time was, I think, 130 bucks. Oh, wow. And these were affiliate or this was your first owned product? So I don't, I don't own that line, but it's, we have exclusive distribution in the USA for the brand. And so, yeah. So yeah, I mean, the, the lowest AOV you could spend on my store was $130 at the very, very start. So you're totally right. And, and yeah, there, there's a trust, I think in these, in these passion niches, like cooking, woodworking, gardening, sewing, crocheting, knitting, all that kind of stuff. There's a, there's some sort of passionate person who's teaching it and having fun along the way and kind of showing you the audience is building some type of digital relationship with that creator. And there's trust being built over time and affinity. So by the time the smart creators at least say, hey, I actually think this is a really solid knitting kit to get started with. And there's some things I don't like about all the knitting kits on the market. So I just did like all these little tweaks and I put it in this box and this is the one that like I would really trust. Well, then of course you're gonna see that convert. And so that's effectively what happened with us in the in the early days. 
So one more big YouTube question before we go a little bit deeper on, on Epic Gardening. What are you kind of seeing today? We kind of talked a little bit about the history, but what do you think is changing and what do you think is successful on YouTube in 2024 or going forward? Yeah, it's so it's so hard to say because I think if you are a YouTuber, certainly, and you, you probably know a lot of you know fellow YouTubers and maybe they're pretty successful, there is this sense of like a meta game to the platform of like what's working right now. Similar to like if you were to play League of Legends or something, a certain champ or, or whatever is, is more powerful in a certain patch. There is that sensibility amongst YouTubers, but I think that what, what that misses is that YouTube is absolutely massive. It, it, it's so vast and your filter bubble on what you consume is, it's hard to detect sometimes, you know? Like if I watch my girlfriend's YouTube account versus my own, uh, it's it's just so different. I mean, it's very peaceful. It's almost all women, and it's it's all sort of like vlog, very artistically shot. Like l- the retention is, is 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 sort of slower paced and all that. Uh, and then if you go to you know my YouTube feed, I don't know two years ago during pandemic times, it'd be like all these random financial guys going like the market's crashing, like all these memes, you know. And so it's very different. I would say the the general consensus, it seems to be, is that the Mr. Beastification era of what's called spectacle YouTube is slowing down a bit. I think there's like some fatigue to that. But every new format that gets developed, well, it never goes away. Like reviews didn't go away. Reactions didn't go away. Vlogging didn't go away. It just sort of isn't the thing of the moment. And so I think that's probably what you'll end up seeing with with some of this more spectacle style content. And then I think a lot of people too who do that type of content aren't, and aren't Mr. Beast. Every, I always like to say like every breakout success, and this is not just true in media or YouTube, but I kind of think in life is is a one of one. Like there's something they did that broke them out in a way that no one else quite did in that formulation before. So you can't be you can't be him. You know, like the the biggest guy I think behind. Mr. Beast in, in sort of the style that he likes to create in is this guy, Matthew Beam, who's quite large. I mean, I think he's like 10 million something subscribers, like well well above what we do, but he's never gonna get to multiple hundreds of millions like Jimmy doing similar things. He's sort of Mr. Beast who does engineering. It's like, okay, well that's, the TAM of that is obviously smaller. So I guess where I'm going is, there is this idea that we're moving towards more relatable content now, longer form, less edited, but, that could be true. I mean, th- th- there's certainly characters that are breaking out that are doing that, but that doesn't mean that that is what to do. One of the things I always think about is like, what are the platforms wanting to incentivize? And it seems like today, Twitter, for example, is trying to incentivize video if you pay attention to what's happening on Twitter. But then with YouTube, it seems like they've really over the past couple of years made a push to TV, which is just generally longer for sitting down, I guess, higher retentive just because you're you're watching like a tv show versus a you know youtube video that you might watch for two seconds so that may kind of dictate in terms of like you know youtube is pushing it as a platform so that content is going to get more more views more watch time essentially just because like youtube is making sure it's getting shipped in samsung tvs as the default video player so just more people are watching it you need content to fill that that supply of or that demand of eyeballs yeah, no, you're you're actually completely correct. When we when we watch my girlfriend and I, when we watch YouTube, obviously it's it's on a TV. We're not like popping a computer up and sitting on a couch. And so I think part of that is your brain, if you're of our age, is still used to consuming TV as TV. And so you're somehow the same video, you are way more likely to re- retain yourself for longer on it, right? even if it's the exact same video. And part of that's like how we grew up. I think part of it's just the the UX of a television is much more annoying to change the video on. Cause like, right, if I was on my computer, I, I could simply, I click on a video, five seconds in, I'm like, I'm out. I can just hit the Google Chrome Omni box and just type a different video concept and, and there you go. On TV, I'm like, well, I mean, I don't really wanna do that. I have to type in each letter, you know? And then what we've noticed is our percentage of devices by share TV is starting to eat away at like, let's say desktop or something like that. Oh, in the Epic Gardening viewership data? Just in our data, right? And I think that's a trend. That's probably a macro trend. I don't think it's like just us, you know? So we are leaning into that a bit with longer form videos that are actually edited a little bit differently. They're not as sort of snappy. They're a little bit more 
kind of pleasing and, and slow. But also, if you think about that on the business end of YouTube, you, you can't link in description, smash the like button, cultivate the subscribe. You can't really do that. And so what we do now is we'll put a, a QR code up for whatever we're talking about. So if it's a product mention, we, we probably don't mention too many products in a video, but like, let's say when our seed catalog is going out in December and January, we do a QR code, say request a seed catalog. So you could just quickly scan it literally sitting on your couch and because there's no other way to to drive a click, right? They're not on the computer uh, so that they can't click. So that's that's one way that we've tried to to combat that. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good point. And that's possibly like with Mr. Beast, it's like go to Walmart and buy Feast or with Prime, it's like, yeah, go to go to the store, just buy it. Which I feel like then you could you could almost start to get into like co-marketing where you almost have like trade spend or you have you get assistance from Walmart and whatever, like the stores or the retailers that you're in that are like also advertising your product because they know to get the Gen Z, we gotta get the, the chocolate and the energy drinks. So they're marketing you for free to drive traffic to them. I mean, that's a pretty good side of that. Yeah, I mean, if I was, maybe they've done this before, but you got to imagine if you're Walmart and you're already kind of making a big bet on this this whole Feastables thing, why not just sponsor the video too? You know, why not just go all the way in? So we've thought about that too. Like, you know, we, we, we carry products we develop ourselves. We carry products we distribute. And some of our successful products we distribute, sometimes we'll go to them and say like, hey, do you want to just also sponsor a video? Because we'll do... There's a vertical gardening kit that we have that we really like. We we just distribute it, uh, and we have a custom color that we've done with them. So you can't you can get the color with us, but you can get the product wherever the product is sold, you know. Uh, and so we'll come and say like, hey, we kind of want to do do a video. Do you want guys want to throw some budget behind it? We'll just really make it about a vertical gardening in this system. Um, and so yeah, there's some interesting sort of like media product weird revenue opportunities. I think you could come up with. Yeah, it's kind of like the the borrowing CAC concept where you like almost share the CAC and I don't know, in, in theory, the marketing spend, if you, if, if you're sharing with people, maybe it's more effective. I don't know. It could probably be worse if you don't put, put out the right kind of product or you don't, the video is not. If you miss, yeah, it's painful if you miss for sure. Yeah. So one, one question I have to kind of take us back to the early days of Epic Gardening, were you initially, like what came first? Was it starting the blog and was like, Hey, I'm going to show this proof of work. I'm going to like write about gardening or were you already really knowledgeable and really into gardening? And I'm like, Oh, make a why about it. What came first? No, I wasn't into gar. I mean, I wasn't, I was getting into gardening as I was building the blog out. Cause I was always like, I was building like websites on GeoCities as a kid. So I was always into the internet, angel fire, you know, all that kind of stuff. Angel fire. I used, I used uh, free webs and GeoCities. Yep, I was on GeoCities. Yeah, GeoCities, it just had the one ad that came out on the side. Angel Fire had like multiple ads, and I felt like their free package was not as good. And when you're, you know, 12 years old, you don't have any money. You don't, you don't have cash, yeah. No, man, I was like, I was on Neopets back in the day, if you remember that game. I remember when they launched the like Neopia stock market, and I YOLO'd all my Neocoins into like one stock and made like, I don't even know how much money I made, but I was like extremely rich on Neopets. And so then, and I'm the oldest of my cousins. And so I gave all my cousins like a thousand Neocoins for a summer. And I was like, you just have to do whatever I tell you to do, like in the real world. So they were like doing my chores and stuff for <laughs> Neocoins. <laughs> how, how much is that worth? A thousand Neocoins? Like it was worth like doing, you know, all my dishes for a summer or something, whatever that conversion is, you know, but Anyways, like the long story short, like I was always into the internet and I was really actually addicted to video games after coming out of college. I played online poker to pay for college. And then I, was, I had an accounting degree, didn't want to use it. So I quit poker because I didn't want to be one of these like mid twenties grinders, but I didn't have anything to supplant it with. So I weirdly just started playing video games, which is just a worse version of poker, frankly. You're not making any money, but you're still spending all the time behind the computer. So gardening was a way to get off the computer simultaneously then building a digital gardening property. So there's some irony there for sure. But yeah, no, it was it was the blog for quite some time. I mean, I, I, made, I tried to make the blog work in 2013, 14 while I was doing these other businesses. I had raised some money for a relationship personal assistant app as a startup. It was like 2014 and we were trying to use like machine learning to like recommend concerts your girlfriend would like or, you know, whatever. It didn't work out. 
I then worked at, I kind of hung my hat up. I was like, yo, I can't like get past a certain level in business. Like I clearly don't understand how to build things. So I worked at a company called Scribe Media. Um, it was called Book in a Box at the time. Eric Jorgensen is the CEO now. He's on he's on Twitter. Great guy. Learned a lot there, then quit in 2016 and went full-time on Epic. And at the time, it was still really just a blog. The other platforms existed, but they weren't really being used much. I was making like four or 500 bucks a month. And I was like, I think I can turn this into something. And that's kind of the, where the founding story begins, really. Yeah, and I think you also started a Reddit community for it. It was this before you leaned into it full time or? That was like my first growth hack. Cause remember back then, like growth hacking was a whole thing. Like there was like Ryan Holiday had a book about it and a bunch of people. It was like a whole tech world. Cause I, I'll, I'll, frankly, like a lot of the advice I've ever learned about growing businesses, I've learned through reading like Paul Graham's essay. So it's like a tech techist approach, but I've just never been that kind of guy. So I just applied it to this, I guess. And yeah, I mean, it, it was it was a way to drive traffic to the blog. Uh, so I, I started a community still alive today called r slash hydro, and it was about hydroponic gardening. And I, that's all I was writing about at the time. So you went very, very niche, like very hydroponic gardening is like a very small subset. What, what is what is hydroponic gardening again? It's growing plants without any soil, basically. So you're growing them in water. In, and you add the nutrients and you control sort of the whole environment. So it's sort of a very like techie, nerdy way to garden, which kind of fit me at, at the time. I just had no space. I had no space. Yeah. Yeah, I was living in a little townhouse with no light exposure. And so I, I was looking up ways that I could grow without uh, any soil. And so that was the way. And yeah, actually Epic, the, the original domain for Epic Gardening was called Exponics. Like just the letter X, P-O-N-I-C-S, Exponics, because... This is the stupidest logic. I was like, well, you know, there's hydroponics and then there's aquaponics, which is growing with fish and water. And then there's like fog ponics. There's all these different subsets of hydroponics. And I was like, well, I'll talk about all those. That'll be like a great blog. Uh, and then I was like, bro, this is way too niche. So I, I rebranded to Epic Gardening and thankfully that was a smart move. But yeah, I mean, in the early days, it was just trying to like build traffic to the blog and then put some you know, ads on and make like $10 a month or something like that. Okay. You were still working, doing the uh, consulting for small businesses. Yeah, I was, I was designing websites, uh, WordPress websites, and then, you know, sort of realized, well, okay, well, you have to just keep selling websites once you deliver on these. So what is something that's recurring? And so I said, I'll design a website, but if you want to, I'll also help you market it. Uh, and this would be like a local San Diego personal injury lawyer or like a local San Diego dentist or something like that. And then you get that recurring revenue from like a marketing contract. And so the, yeah, the whole logic, like I said, was the, the blog was just sort of my proof point of like, look, like this gets traffic and it, it looks good. So clearly I could do the same for you. And then kind of went from there. Was there a moment then when you realized, I think you mentioned making like 10 bucks a month. I think you also said 400 bucks a month. Maybe it was one of the numbers. At what point were you like, okay, I think this can be a eight, nine figure a year revenue type of business? Like, was there like a point where you're like, I'm going all in? That took a while. I mean, I've never really had that in my brain to build like some massive crazy business just for the sake of it, I guess. And so all I really wanted when I quit in 2016, when I left Scribe Media is the blog was making four or $500 a month. And I actually thought I'd be farming for a living. I thought what I would do is I would sign contracts with like neighbors and farm in their yards, give them a share of it. And the rest of it, I would be able to sell to local restaurants and stuff like that, um, like farmer's markets and all that. And then basically the way that business model would have worked and does work, just it's quite small scale, is you you lease the land for a dollar and they pay the utilities and stuff because you're beautifying their property and they're getting so free groceries from it. Uh, and so your COGS is quite low besides labor. And then, so your margins are actually pretty decent on, on the produce uh, and it's highly localized produce. So you can charge a higher, you know, per pound price or per count price. So that's what I thought I would do, but. That's a cool idea. Yeah, it, it really works. I mean, there's there's a couple guys on YouTube in those early days, 2013, 14, who were doing something like that. And I was like, oh, I'll just do that in San Diego. Sounds like a fun way to live. But I didn't feel comfortable just making 400 bucks passively and like draining my savings trying to make that work. And so I told myself I'd spend like two or three months trying to build the blog up to three grand a month in revenue. And I was like, well, I could live off three grand and then I could just 
that while that's ticking away, I can start this thing. And then what ended up happening is I did hit the three grand a month in about two or three months. And then two, three months later, it was five. And I was like, well, that's 60K a year. Then I hit, I think 2017, the revenue ramp for Epic was 2016 was $17,000. And that was doing it uh, six months out of the year. And scaling up over time. Yep. And then 2017 was a 75,000 in revenue. 2018 was 225. 2019 was 500. I started offering products that year. 2020 was 2.8 million. 2021 was 7.3 million. Uh, we closed the Series A round of funding at the very tail end of that year with uh, the Churning Group. And then we've gone on to do multiple tens of millions since then. Obviously, some of that's acquisitive revenue. But Epic as a standalone business is also an eight-figure business. So yeah, pretty crazy. Uh, but to answer the question of like, when did I think it could be eight or nine figure business? I'd say 2019, I was like, oh, well, products is the actual business. So that clearly has a higher ceiling. That was when you did 500K. That was when I did 500. The first product you were probably, what was that? You said it was the raised. Raised metal beds. Yeah. Yeah. So the revenue breakdown there is that, that year prior, 2018 was 75. That's all media revenue. So that's like ad rev, you know, affiliate brand. So the next year was 250 in the media side. And then eight months out of the year is when I was selling products. So only about two thirds of the year I was selling product. Uh, and that was another 250,000. So I was like, well, I just completely dominated my media's revenue in you know less time in one year. And so I was like, okay, well, clearly I was sort of a fool before thinking that that was the business, you know? And then in, in 2020, of the 2.8, 500,000 was media and 2.3 was was product. So dramatic, dramatic flip. Yeah. And, and, and now, you know, our media business at Epic is, is multiple seven figures, probably not many, many multiples, but it's, it, it's a probably one and a half, $2 million business. And the product revenue is obviously way more than that. So that was, that was kind of when I realized the opportunity. Yeah, and it's probably like you 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 generate most of the revenue from the, the selling the products. You would be making the content anyways to sell the products, but instead of it being a cost center, you make a little bit of money from it. Which is probably is that how you think about it, or that's how it works. So so this is my thesis, I guess, on how these creator businesses work in the early days is you build a community, you build an audience, you can sustain yourself from that, but you need to run it really lean because you're not. You can't float like five, a hundred thousand dollar a year salaries on that. You know, you'd be underwater. So you run it really lean and you can develop some sort of product or service off of that. That is what helps to grow the business. But you also have basically a negative CAC because you're getting paid to, to produce the thing that's selling the product, right? Unlike, let's say, a traditional direct to consumer business, maybe they spend 20, 30% of revenue on acquisition and they have zero organic traffic until they reach some sort of weird brand snowball, like, you know, Casper Mattress spends hundreds of millions on ads. Now you know Casper Mattress. Whereas with a creator style, it's, I know this person. Oh, they just launched this thing. I'm going to go get it. Uh, and, and that flywheel starts. So up until 2021, when we touched 7.3 ish million in revenue, all of that was done with zero dollars on paid acquisition. So our our acquisition was revenue generating and our products obviously were revenue generating. So it's you you basically delete like 20 points of margin from your cost structure in a creator business. And that's why I think at least they want to be lean teams and small and very, very profitable cash flowing businesses, or they want to be very big and trying to destroy the market and transform it. But in the middle, I think you get eaten alive by both sides of the equation. So you either have to be really small, really niche, really lean, generate cash flow, et cetera, or like you said, massive takeover or create a category. You're probably able to raise some money at that point too, to, to offset some of the, the, the hyperscaling cash flow kind of not quite matching up. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think if you look at us, like I could have said no and actually did a few times to the series A round that we did and. The alternative, which I would always say is like, look, we're doing many, many millions of dollars a year in revenue and it's very profitable. Like, what is the point of raising money then? Like the logic, especially in like a VC sort of model, like what, what's the logic? I, I already have product market fit. Yeah, you have less control over the business. They're probably like, you gotta hit this, you gotta hit these milestones and targets, which there's a lot of pressure. You just, you, you can't mess up. You gotta stick to the, the plan and the track. Totally. Yeah. And so that would, that would always be my counter. And so I would say like, 
you know, if someone is running one of those businesses, you sort of, it, it's almost like, do you want to play the game or do you, do you not want to play that game? And I wanted to play it because I thought there was a lot of opportunity. And I think these types of businesses are really well suited to really smart strategic acquisitions because, you know, take, we will rewind way back in the day. Like let's go to 2017. I made my first acquisition of a thousand dollars. It was a thousand dollar buy. And what I was doing is I was getting into houseplants at the time. It was kind of when the houseplant craze was going on, but I had no articles on that on the blog and the blog was all I was focusing on. And so I was researching for a houseplant article and I found this blog called houseplantsforyou.com. And it was like an OG design. Like it was like 2007 style design. And I was like, you know what? I, I did some research on it. It was getting like 30, 40,000 unique sessions a month. And so I, I did a who is search on the blog because it just looked unmaintained, you know? So I do a who is search. Fortunately, the guy did not have his who is protected so I could see his name. Then I searched his name. It was like some Indian VC who's living in India. Uh, I found him on Twitter. And I, I shot him a message. I was like, hey, I found your houseplantsforyou.com blog. Can I just buy this blog? It doesn't seem like you're doing anything with it. And he's like, yeah, sure. Like, I actually forgot I had it. And so I go, well, how much do you want it? How do you, how much do you want for it? He's like, well, there's 90 articles. So I'll, what about $10 for an article? Like, that's my valuation model. I was like, well, hell yeah, dude. Like, that's effectively free. Because all I did was I just did the the RPM math, the revenue for, per mil, right? And, and so I was like, well, if I buy it for a thousand, it, it pays itself off in like three or four months if there's no growth. Just from ad, like AdSense or were you using something else at the time? Well, at the time, yeah. At the time I was on, I think I think it was called Ezoic, but I was making $5 per a thousand. And so, which is really trash, frankly. I should have been making more, but regardless, you know, 30, 40,000 sessions, call that, you know, 150, $200 a month or something like that. So you're buying it for a thousand. You're like, this thing pays itself off in like a year if I do nothing at all. But what I did is I, I bought it for a thousand. I like went through an escrow service. I was so scared. I was like, oh my God, like what if he steals it? You know, a thousand bucks. Cause I, I mean, how much money did I have at the time? 20,000 bucks, you know? So it's like 5% of my stack, you know? So I was, I was scared and then I bought it and I went to this coffee shop every day and I would pick the top, I, I'd rank the articles by traffic. And I'd pick two of them every day and I'd rewrite them and redirect them to my blog. So I'd improve the article and redirect his link to my link. And then what happened a couple months later is that chunk of sort of migrated articles was a hundred thousand or so months of a month in sessions added to the blog at a higher RPM. And so I paid the blog off that acquisition off in like, I don't know, two and a half months or something like that. And so that's, that's when I was like, okay, you, you don't have to always do everything from scratch all the time. Obviously looking back, I mean, we made some, we made one very large acquisition with the seed company and <laughs> looking at a thousand dollars, it's like, dude, we spend that probably in the time since we've talked in multiple areas of the business already, you know? So it's kind of funny looking back, but frankly, I mean, it was, it was, it worked really well back then. Yeah. Well, even 5% of the size of the business, no matter how big the business is, that's a sizable thing. Like, you know, what do you do in a year? 5%, that's like three weeks or something, two and a half weeks. I don't mean my math is off, but like, yeah, it's like a pretty decent chunk of time you got to invest in something like that. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, dude, when I, when I bought the uh, first container, shipping container of those metal raised beds in 2019, it was $30,000 out of 80,000 that I had in the business. So it was a big bet, but it was, a, I think it was quite de-risked, but yeah, I mean, sometimes you're just spending a big chunk. Yeah. So then how did you decide? the first product? Because I'm assuming you looked at different things. How did you decide what was the right one to sell? What was the process? So this is where I think you could be so smart, you're dumb type of thing. I like, I like that. I like that phrase a lot. So I, I had tried to think of products. I was like, okay, well, I need to like ideate and like create a the, the, this, that, the other. And, and I do like microgreen seeds or kits or this or that. And then meanwhile, what I was not realizing is that, well, I have a media business basically. And people watch that content or they consume it and brands want that, right? That's why brands do brand deals. They pay you to put their product in front of your audience. So I was like getting products from a bunch of different brands and I would just kind of work them into the garden if I liked them. And I wouldn't really mention them unless you know it was a sponsored thing. And there was one that everyone's like, what is that thing? It looks really cool. And it was this metal raised bed. 
And so I woke up one day and I was like, why am I like trying to invent all these different products when everyone just wants this thing that they can't get in America? Why don't I just email those guys and just say like, hey, do you have it? So I emailed them like probably every two months uh, saying, hey, do you, do you guys have a distributor here? Can I sell them? They had one already, I guess. And they're like, no, no, no. And then in the end of 2018 going into 2019, they emailed back and said, actually, our distributor decided they wanted to pause. Do you want to do something together? And they basically taught me how e-com worked to some degree. And I made so many like clown moves back then. Dude, so, okay, so so you, you got to remember, like, I am at this point in time, like, I don't really know e-com at all. I don't know anything about it. I don't have Shopify. I'm like not savvy in that world at all. I know media and I'm just so clueless. Like, I don't know how shipping works. I don't know how fulfillment works, anything like that. So my grand plan was I'm going to spend $30,000. I'm going to get 500 units of these metal beds from my supplier in Australia, which are like sort of the, they're like the guys who invented the product, you know? So great brand. And so I go, okay, cool. I'll, I'll spend that money. I'm like, teach me how these Inco terms work. How do I know who owns the product when? Like, how the hell does it even get to America? Does it, do I like go get it at the port? Do I like drive up there? You know, <laughs> you the trucker. yeah, I had no idea, dude. And so my grand plan was when it got to the port of Long Beach, I was going to have someone drive it down and then I was going to rent like a storage space out of like a Costco, just like something you do if you were moving, you know, I put all those beds, the, the raised bed product in that. I'd get like satellite internet or something. And then I'd like print the labels and ship out of that little thing. Cause I didn't know 3PLs existed. Okay. So you were trying to like full stack, build the whole supply chain yourself basically. Cause I just didn't know that you could hire someone to do it. It was just so dumb. And and so, so then I talked to another friend of mine who, who had an e-com business. He's like, what? He's like, dude, what? Like, what are you doing? And, and so, and, and this was like, a week before they were landing, I was setting, I was like calling these storage facilities, you know? So this guy goes, he goes, let me just introduce you to my third party logistics company. And so then magically they pick it up or a trucking company picks it up, brings it to them. I have my Shopify, their Shopify, my Shopify hooks to ship station at the time. And then we both have access to ship station and they ship the orders out. Uh, Cause I guess I thought like it wasn't authentic if I wasn't doing it myself or something, but like, that's not what I'm good at. So why would I be doing that? But no, it was so silly, dude. And there's a lot of other stories from that time. But basically what ended up happening is two weeks into shipping that product out from Australia, which is it's still on the water, it had sold out on my Shopify store on pre-order. And so the 30K becomes whatever, 90. And so I use another 30 and buy another one, sell that out. So that's another 90. So I'm I'm, I'm flush now, you know, and I go, oh, crap, this is actually the business. And so I bought, I think that year I bought five 20 foot containers, which is a half sized container. So you said there's about 500 of these things? About 500 of this particular SKU would fit in that 20 foot container. So I probably sold two, two and a half thousand of these in that first year. Uh, and I was like, okay, now I do not like spending as much money as I'm spending on freight. So I just need to buy a bigger container. So you'd buy the 40 foot high cubes, which is sort of the standard. Uh, and then you start getting into like, how much am I paying per unit to ship it? You start really getting into the optimization. Um, and, and then I started getting mad. This is 2019, this is 2020. I, I go, yo, I'm paying these three PLs like 20 grand a month. I don't like this. And this is, you know, I never thought I'd raise any money for the business. So I go, F that dude, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna buy a warehouse and do it all myself. So I bought a warehouse in San Diego down here and I was like, hey, I'm just going to YOLO, do my own warehouse thing. I like, I had, I had one in-person employee at the time who's my garden assistant. I was like, bro, we're going to go get our forklift cards. So we like go, went and got our forklift cards. I bought like a $50,000 forklift and started unloading all these containers myself. The logic there was more of like personal logic of, well, I can, my business rents the property I own, right? And they're separate businesses. So from like, a, I have a real estate business that owns the property. I have Epic that, that rents the property from the real estate business. So like just on a personal sort of finance level, you're building this nice like little little structure. Yeah, obviously changes when things get more complex, but that was the kind of logic there. And it, it worked for quite some time until we started offering a more complex product line. And then it was, it was too difficult. And we went back to 3PLs and then we bought the seed company and they have a warehouse. So we're doing some stuff there too. Interesting. So you have your own warehouse again, and also still using one 3PL? Do you use multiple? We use multiple. Yeah. Because 
weirdly, it was like a really obvious product to start with because everyone wanted it, but also it's not a great direct to consumer product for the dimensionality and the weight of it. It's almost the perfect worst style product because it's high in dimensions and also heavy. Um, so when you get charged like on a dimensional weight basis, you're kind of getting screwed. If I ship from San Diego, which is where I live to Maine, like you're out on a 60 pound bed, you're out like $90, $100 of the $330 of cost. So it's like, thank God I don't have to pay for advertising because I would have zero margin left after this, you know? And so we, we do use 3PLs on both coasts to cut down the average ship zone to like a four or so. And there's eight zones. So it's like roughly half. So yeah, we, we have to, otherwise we our cost structure would be too high. That's fair. Yeah. For anybody listening who's not familiar, basically the country, like talking about the US, it's kind of cut up into these different zones. So we might say like the state of Texas is a zone. There's like a ring outside of Texas or something or like the middle couple states in the country, like North Dakota, South Dakota, Colorado. I don't know how the zones are split up, but it's point origin, right? So like from here to Texas might be a four from San Diego, but obviously from like Ohio would be less or something. You know what I mean? So it's, it's the distance traveled and, and each carrier has like different calculations for it and all that. And it's basically like the more zones you're going through, just the more expensive. And if you stay inside of a zone or only go two zones or whatever, it's, it's cheaper. Just it's kind of how they do the pricing just generally. It just has to go less far. And so there's less handoffs, there's less fuel surcharges, all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, like that's why I, I always get jealous of like, I know you had Sean Frank on the podcast, like shipping a small wallet. I just am like, oh my God, like what a dream, you know, obviously it's a, it's a less pricey product too, but still, you know, uh, his fulfillment cost is probably net way lower than ours. Yeah. And it's just like, here's a wallet, just chuck it onto the truck. Like it's, <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit. Not only that, but like, if you think about it, man, like the, the form factor of your product line, think about our seed business, how many, if we had to, how many seed packs could we fit in a 40 foot container? It's like probably millions. Uh, how many beds could we fit? the most is like 1200, 1300. And so that changes your whole cost structure. Cause if I wanted to order hundred thousand units of beds, like I actually need to fundamentally change the way those are shipped to me. I need to ship them in components or something and assemble them stateside. Cause it's simply too expensive. Otherwise you'd almost need a full boat. Like you'd need your own uh, carrier, like container ship. Just one ship just for us. <laughs> so I would assume then the siege probably have pretty good margins then or better, or it was probably like a better margin business as you started to shift into that? The seeds are great because there are a few things that as a gardener, you really need and love to purchase every season. And, and you, as a gardener, you're just so excited. Every, every season there's new varieties coming out or you, you need to re-up on a particular herb or tomato or something that you really like. And so it's like, it's almost like collecting Pokemon, like for a gardener, you know, I want this variety, I want that one. And then you're, you're generally, you are buying seeds a couple times a season. You're shifting to a summer crop or a fall crop or something like that. And yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the margin on, on even just, if you were to look at shipping, like it's, it's way more favorable and, and just due to the way that the product is produced, it's, it's, it's a, it's a great business and it's one that we really enjoy running. How did you go through hiring people? You have this gardening assistant. I think you said now about 50 to 80 employees. How do you think about it? How do you convince people to join? What's your process for finding good people? All that stuff. You know, honestly, like this is not my best area. This is something that I, I wish I was better at. The, the early days, the very first hire I ever made was a writer off of Upwork who now runs our, she's our staff horticulturist actually. She used to run our blog up until last year. We made a big blog acquisition and she's our staff horticulturist today. So she was off of Upwork. My garden assistant. Actually, when I moved into the house that I'm in now and started that Epic Homesteading channel I mentioned, he lived around the corner and he had started gardening in the pandemic. So he was probably like six, seven months. He was a PhD geologist student and he DM'd me. He had like a little pumpkin as his avatar and his name is Jacques. So I thought some like old French guy was like trying to slide in, you know, and he goes, Hey, I think I'm, you know, I think I'm your neighbor. And I was like, Oh God, dude, like, don't start here. You know, cause this happens. Like if, if you, if you have a presence online, people will just show up at your house and, and they'll do weird stuff. So I was like, Oh my God. So this guy, he, he walks over, he's got like a straw hat on. He's like this 28 year old Bulgarian guy named Jacques. And so we started working together and I think about six months, he left his PhD to come work for us. And that's how I found him. Uh, my initial assistant was actually a fan of Epic and 
she decided to come come work and she now runs our customer experience so she's head of customer experience at, at epic a lot of the hires that came after that though were a result of doing the series a round right so we we do the series a round and then we're like okay well you were running this company on a skeleton crew because going back to that like they want to be these businesses want to be small or really big so i was in the small phase so they're like well you need someone to run your commerce like you need someone to run your operations. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Cause I'm actually doing all of those things. Uh, and so frankly, it was a lot of like networking, recruiting. Uh, we did, we did recruit for a few roles. You're saying hire a recruiter. We, we hired a recruiter for a couple of roles, but, but the rest are coming from, from the network. I mean, the Turner group has a, has a really fantastic network of people and operators. And so frankly, I, I wish I was a, a better person to answer questions on hiring, but I'm, I'm just simply not yet. I've, I've had some, you know, some big, big learning lessons. The decision to raise money, I think, is a pretty significant one for the kind of business that you have. Like, how did you decide I'm going to do it versus not do it? And then how did you meet training group? How did that process go? Yeah. I mean, man, maybe you can tell me because in it, this was 2021, it's probably like February or March. I think once you get past a certain scale of business, somehow investors just like know, even though you may have never disclosed something, you know, like I, I wasn't out here like I'm making this much money. Somehow they just know. And so 2021, I was just getting emails cold from Bessemer partners and all these different people. And I'm like, delete, 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 delete. Something about the churn email really stood out because I admired the companies they had built. You know, I'm not a sports guy, but there's it's no secret that Barstool Sports is, is a fantastically successful company. Meat Eater is, is a portfolio company of theirs. I just like the ethos of that brand. They have some other good outdoor brands too. Yeah, totally. Food 52. They've done some stuff in anime. And so it's, it's a, it was just like my vibe. That's the world I play in. And so they we kind of danced for a while. And the idea was, hey, look, like at Epic, you've already proved out this whole idea of this content to commerce sort of buzzword that you hear tossed around a lot. And I was like, yeah, I know. So like, what are you talking to me for? And they were like, well, it's actually like way bigger than you think it is. And I was like, yeah, I know, but I don't really care to make it like that. And then, you know, it took a while for me to get my head around it, but I was like, you know what, actually this could be really fun because, you know, offering the products at, at that time, I'd already had a couple different products that we were offering that I knew were better and we were selling them and they were doing really well. And I was like, you know what, we could actually attack this industry and make it a better experience for everyone. Uh, especially people like me who I didn't grow up gardening. Like I had no clue how this, this whole thing worked and it, it's given me so much to my life. And I was like, man, if, if, if I could do that for more people, that would be amazing. And so that was, I would say that was like the general logic. And at the same time, I was like, I'm already out ahead in my market and there's copycats coming both on the media and the product side. So if I'm already out ahead, why not just make sure I stay ahead by partnering with probably the best investors in that exact type of business that I'm running? So that's that's kind of how it was. Plus, like, I mean, I'm sure you know, like 2021 was just a nutty year. And I was like, I don't think these opportunities just like come around every year. And it turns out I was right on that one. Yeah, I mean, what I'm seeing now, it's like if you're not an AI company, it's impossible to raise money. What do you think about that, by the way? Like the, the whole AI thing, like... Are, are people just like YOLOing their bets into AI because something's going to win? Uh, is that how that works? Of all the, these kind of hype cycles that we've gone through with whether it's crypto, remote work, AI's had, I guess, multiple in the past, like mobile, the internet, cloud, like all these different technologies that come in. I do think that AI is one of the more legitimate, like actually going to deliver business results over time, whether it's cutting costs, we're kind of seeing that like public companies are coming out and saying, you know, we, we're, we're incorporating AI to our customer support and response times are way faster, which leads to higher customer service or satisfaction and potentially more revenue, but also it's all AI. There's no people. So we're cutting costs. So I think it's, it's very real just in terms of the business performance that it can deliver. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of large companies be like, all right, we need to incorporate this and we're shifting our entire business. So the way I think about it is just as an early stage investor, I just need to make sure I'm not investing in things that are directly a top priority of a company that does billions of dollars in revenue. Even though, you know, it does, the big companies don't always win. If it's pretty easy for them to, and like the CEO is incentivized and the whole company is like, oh, we can double our margins if we, if we ship business, like they will 
do that. There's a ton of nuance to that. But I generally think about, okay, what are new areas where we haven't been able to incorporate software and AI will unlock new types of businesses that just never really existed before on the internet. I think a lot of people are saying like in healthcare, in education, in robotics, like robotics is really interesting. You don't need a mouse and click point type of UI. You don't need like a touch screen. It can literally be spoken. I don't, I don't know when the time on this will be, but like brain interface computing, like the neural link stuff is in 50 years. It'll it'll probably be here. It'll be here for sure in 50. So I kind of think about just like, are you building a business that just has never been possible before? And like no one else is is really trying to do that. So like, I think we'll see in, in like healthcare, like you've probably seen their studies that have been like, hey, this AI large language model actually outperformed a doctor. Like it gave better advice. I think you have to be very, very careful. But if like what, what AI does a lot of times is it just kind of augments or does an even better job of like, low labor repetitive skills so data entry super interesting example where you know you can replace data entry with ai it's like no human actually likes doing data entry you enter the data to then make decisions from it so if you can use large language models to somehow automate data entry people might lose there might be some like some labor efficiencies and savings there some people lose their jobs, but also some people, there'll be new jobs unlocked because we don't have to spend time doing data entry anymore. Um, we've kind of, I feel like I've kind of, we've kind of hit on this a little bit in, on the podcast you know, in the past where like accountants were like freaking out about spreadsheets, right? Like, they're going to replace our jobs, but it's like, well, it actually saves you a ton of time as the accountant. It's legally required you need an accountant. So like you can't get rid of them. That one's safe. Yeah, that one's safe. Well, what do you think though about this idea of, I'm not super knowledgeable here, but like, it, doesn't the LLM sort of collapse to being a commoditized service? And then what really matters is is the data input that goes into it. So you have to invest in something that has some sort of like proprietary gated data. Otherwise, any anyone could analyze public data with an, any LLM off the shelf, right? Eventually. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but the way I think about it with the internet is most technology gets commoditized and it usually comes down to your distribution or like your customer relationships. So that could be unique data. So I guess I'm just thinking in like the gardening space, maybe there's no one's really built software for nurseries or something. And you have, you know, you can capture data on when to grow, when to plant, what works best. That leads to you being able to build like a really good software product on like the, like the business of run, like a vertical software business in a box for a nursery or a gardening center or something. Or again, I'm just kind of making things up here, but I get it. You're saying, you're saying that you use use an LLM, use the project you have to then create a product off of that. Because like with, with these large language models, if you look at it, this, the efficiency is getting better, like their intelligence, so to speak, their speed, their cost is coming down. All these things are just going to keep trending down to the point of, I don't know the exact time, but eventually it will just be like the cloud where they're all sort of the same. Like there, there is differences and different things are specialized in certain things. Like you might use Azure for a certain reason, you might use AWS or Oracle or IBM cloud. Like they all kind of have different purposes to them, but there'll only be a couple and you don't really care, but, but there might be lock-in because you start to build your stack on AWS and it's like, ah, it's kind of expensive, but like it's just, it's too hard to switch to Azure. So we're just going to stick with AWS. I think if I had to guess, that'll kind of be how this plays out, which in, in a lot of cases, some of these language model tools will be related to the cloud also, which is why you see a lot of them starting to partner up, like AWS and Anthropic, OpenAI and Microsoft. Could you say then that like one strategy could be to just buy public stock? This is not investment advice because I am i don't even buy public stocks. I'm really bad at that. But like you couldn't you just buy stock of companies that have the best ability to capitalize on the idea that LLMs will sort of become commoditized? right? Like a Google or whatever, like maybe the FANG companies or something like that. Yeah. I don't know which one. And again, yeah, not investment advice, but if you think about like, so Facebook, for example, what is Facebook's business? It's getting a credit card hooked up and just automatically showing ads that will convert. That's basically what their business model is. And if you start to incorporate things like generative AI into the ad creation process, currently, like if you're running an ad manager program, you got to like, tweak things, upload, set a bunch of parameters, 
But if it can just do it automatically, like it just trains and learns itself, you can go like Facebook's tools get even more powerful, which means that they can charge more money for them, make more money. And it also just makes it harder to compete in, in, in theory. If you're trying to start up a new ad network, it's like, why would somebody waste their time trying to scale TikTok ads or Snap ads or insert whatever subscale platform when you can just use Facebook and hit 2 billion people and you literally just type in how much money you want to spend and like the ROI for a target and it just does it for you and like creates ads automatically. It's it's kind of kind of crazy. So yeah, I mean, that's definitely one way to think about it. I think like some things that people are thinking we'll see is like new types of semiconductors and chips that like process some of these models faster. So I think pe- people might be familiar with like with NVIDIA, the stock price is I mean, probably one of the best performing public companies or any company over the last couple of years. Maybe that's the weakness to NVIDIA is like these new chips that NVIDIA can't do. I have no idea. I'm not super deep on the, the semi space, but I know it's kind of, it's been a popular kind of startup category. It's like we're building new chips that are like custom designed for processing these large language models faster. A sell the shovels thesis there, right? Going to the hardware layer. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I have no idea where all this is going to go, but all I know is I, we are using it. I mean, I'm, we're, we're using it here and there, it, even just at Epic. Yeah. I mean, just Adobe's generative AI for removing stuff. Like we can take imperfect thumbnails now for our YouTube videos and just clean up a little trash in the background or, you know, change this change the weather to sunny or whatever it is, which you could have done. You're right anyways, but it's way faster to do it with AI than and, and patch up whatever kind of job they did than have a guy out there doing it manually, right? So it's crazy how much faster it is. Yeah, and then the, the question is, will Adobe see the biggest benefits from that? Or is it a new startup? That like, Because Adobe's tools can incorporate it or something, like if that would be a reason. But in this case, it's probably like, well, there's Adobe, there's like Photoshop, there's Canva, there's probably a couple other that I'm missing, but there's probably a couple editing tools where if the product team chooses that we're going to incorporate generative AI in a product, it will probably be there. So there'd probably have to be something in like the architecture of the product, like it's all desktop and there's no web component. So it's hard to incorporate generative AI or something. I don't know if that's actually true anymore because I think they've all kind of adopted web. So no, that makes sense. I mean, I, it kind of goes to your point about saying like distribution, if the tech is getting commoditized, the distribution is what matters. So if, if unless they flub it, like a Canva really should benefit the most from some of the generative AI stuff or Photoshop should, it feels like a self-owned if they, they don't, right? Yeah. And it's probably like unlocking a new customer segment too. So you could maybe say, let's just say YouTube thumbnails are really underserved. Like it's just so hard to make those in Canva or Photoshop. And somebody makes a tool that's like, the best tool, it's like 10x better for designing YouTube thumbnails, which is like sneakily a pretty big market. Let's say there's like 10 million people that need to design it, that this thing gets to 10 million users and then they find an adjacent category like TikTok editing or short form reels editing. And then suddenly it's like, oh, this thing has 50 million people using it. They've hit scale. Like you, you can't really kill them. And they're like one of the incumbents. You buy them or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that actually, you know, dude, I would, I would love a tool the, 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 one of the problems, I, and this might be very niche, but like something that I always get frustrated by is there's different form factors for the content, right? So you have vertical, you have long form, there's different run times on particular platforms like, like YouTube only lets you go 60 seconds, whereas TikTok will go 10 minutes vertical and IG will go 90 seconds. So I have a piece like we just launched, I just launched a book and I did a piece of short form media on it that I was very, very po- positive would do well because it has done well in the past. And so I sort of just adjusted it. But, but I have to send that piece to my post-production team and redo it in like four different ways. One with captions, one without, one is a 60 second cut down, one is a 90 second, one that needs a thumbnail because it's going to go on the IG feed, one that doesn't need one because it's on TikTok. And I'm like, I wish I had a machine I could put that in and give it that prompt and just say, please adjust for all these different form factors. Because that is sort of the post-production version of accountants, you know, using long division or whatever instead of a spreadsheet. And so I wish something like that would exist. Uh, so maybe it will. And then the question is, will that be built into the Instagram platform? Like, should should Instagram just do that for you? And and then and then the second question, is it a priority for them? Like they might be like, ah, oh, we don't care. So there's an opportunity for someone else. So that's a very difficult needle to thread, which essentially just means you have to be super like on and 
to do, do a lot of diligence, constantly using the platforms, understanding the roadmaps, all that kind of stuff. One other thing I really want to talk about, um, and I mentioned this to you earlier, was the book that you just wrote. So uh, just for the audience sake, when I was telling my wife that we were talking, she's like, oh, I love Kevin, epic gardening guy. And then I realized the next day, my mother-in-law had bought your new book, Epic Homesteading. It was just sitting there. So what was the thinking of of writing the book? It's It kind of seems like a new category. Are you kind of getting into it or talk us through that? So, yeah. So, I mean, I look, I worked at Scribe. So I, I launched a lot of author's books and I understood the traditional publishing model. And then Scribe's is obviously sort of a elevated self-publishing, let's call it. And so the logic of writing a book for economic reasons is always pretty much god awful. It's it's pretty much terrible, especially with traditional publishing. You're going to get eight to ten percent, maybe twelve percent royalty. You're going to get an advance. You have to earn the advance, and then you start till you get anything else. And so, as a cash flow stream, it's like not a lot. Even for me, like I, I sold my first book, sold like forty, fifty thousand copies. It's not. I'm like not ungrateful for the royalty stream at all, but it's I could not live off of that at all at all. So what I decided to do is I was like, you know, the first book you, you you're wanting to do because of the social proof, right? There's something in the world. I, I'm, I'm an author now. And there's, there's certain things that sort of come with that. Uh, plus I just really wanted to do it. I like creating media, right? So this is a new form of media that I'd never created before, but when you plug in the commerce side of the business, you basically become your own retailer for your own product that you wrote. And so in our case for the Epic homesteading book, I'm pretty sure by now we probably sold like 2,500 copies on our store for 30 bucks a pop, buying them wholesale from our own publisher, from my own publisher. And so I get a royalty on stuff that sold off of Epic, and then we just buy wholesale for stuff sold on Epic. So pretend like there's no other parties in the business, pretend I still sort of own Epic. I benefit way more as a business owner by buying my own copies and reselling them to my audience than I do just writing the book itself. But then also for me, it serves as the mission of the company. Like the mission is to teach the world to grow and in, in gardening, especially a tactile thing that you can bring out into the garden with you and, and like flip through is really important. It's why I started the podcast too. I was like, well, you're, if you're gardening, you can't watch or read. So you have to listen. So I'll, I'll make a podcast. Uh, and so then I'm in your ears while you're actually doing the thing you're learning about. Uh, so that's the long and short of it. It's probably the last book I'll write for a while because they're arduous. Um, it's weird. Cause like from a return perspective on time, I've made a YouTube video that got 10, 11 million views in an hour and a half. And I've made a book that the most I've ever sold is 40, 50,000 copies per, per book. And that took like, I don't even know how many hours, you know, it's hard to say. And so, yeah, long story short, only do it if you really, really want to. Interesting. So you said you also, maybe we didn't hit on this podcast. Is it just kind of like a is that a big revenue driver or is that just kind of like a secondary stay top of mind kind of thing? Pretty much. I mean, we're, we may we may be doing some direct revenue stuff with the podcast soon. I, I historically have not. But yeah, the idea was I'll just make every type of media that I can make about this, this topic that I love. And initially it was a daily show. It was three minutes. And so it'd be like, here's how to prune your tomatoes. Go, go do it. You know, <laughs> it'd be very simple because every podcast in my space was like 45 minutes on how to keep chickens. And I wanted like four minutes of the 45 as actionable advice. So I was like, I'll just make that part. And I just did that every single day. And so now it's a little bit less frequent. It's, it's probably five episodes a week. Usually there's a guest or we'll have someone on our team come on and talk what they're doing in the garden. And they will be like eight or 10 minutes. And then we did launch a video version of the podcast this past year. But yeah, the podcast is just kind of a, it's more of like a community thing than anything else. And then what are some of the big things you're following in gardening more broadly? Like, are people going to start growing their own food at home? What's kind of like the galaxy brain? We fast forward the next decade of gardening. What should we be following and paying attention to? I think that there will be a lot more people growing some some percentage of food at home it's you're you're never really going to get to like true scale there but uh, i think you'll see a lot more people growing like their own fruit trees at home once they realize how how enjoyable that is i think you'll see people like grow some stuff but then start to supplant the rest of their consumption with with local providers of of different things i mean i'm i'm seeing it in different communities it's weird how sometimes it's it's left leaning politicized media it's or right leaning depending on the year like right now at least there's a lot of this like trad sort of stuff going around on on Twitter and other communities. 
And right now it's like more right-leaning people that are like, your food is poisoning you, your this is this and that. Whereas like three, four years ago, it would have been more left-leaning people saying like, we need to do better for the environment. Like we need to grow our own food. So I think it's, it's weirdly one of these places on the internet where at least in my comment section, there's a communal sensibility d depending on no matter what your ideology is, as long as you don't talk about it, everyone's kind of, everyone's kind of there to grow. Uh, so I, I don't know. I think it, it certainly got a boost from the pandemic, but weirdly, unlike many of those those pandemic hobbies, it hasn't quite fallen off the way that some of those did. Like, not that many people are baking sourdough anymore compared to that many people gardening. Yeah, that's interesting because gardening is hard. Like making sourdough, it's like eh, a couple hours, whatever. But gardening, you like sign up for. It needs to become ingrained in your life of staying on top of it. It's part of a yeah. It's a, it's sort of an identity level shift uh, once you really get into it. So one thing I noticed in some of the content you do, you'll have like Carrie Underwood on the channel, you'll have different celebrities. Is that like a growth tactic? Is that a them coming to you? Is that a, like, what's the benefit of doing that? How did those kind of evolve? They just did, like it was just random. So someone someone told me that Carrie was following our account on Instagram. And I'm, I mean, I, I don't mind country music. I'm not like a super fan of any particular artist, and so, I, I followed her back. She posted something about tomatoes. I was like, that's a huge tomato. Uh, like, congratulations. Like, that's a very large tomato. This is from the Epic Gardening account? Yeah, I was like, hey, you know, honestly, that's a really impressive tomato. Just, you know, just gardener to gardener type of thing. And then she was, she she lives in Nashville. And she messaged me and said, like, hey, do you know, I just got a greenhouse. Like, do you know anyone that can help in Nashville, like, set a greenhouse up? And I was like, well, I'm actually going to be in Nashville next month, which I was not, but I could have been if she said yes. And so my girlfriend was actually going out for a conference. So I was like, oh, I'll just tag along with her. And so that's how that one worked out. Um, we did one with Kehlani. She just DM me on TikTok. The thing about it too is like, you you could make it a growth thing, but then it, to me, it internally becomes semi cringe. And so I'd rather just have it be just, if they are into it, then let's do it because that should make it a lot better than like both of our teams kind of like collaborating, you know? Yeah. Versus they they just like really like gardening. You really like gardening. It's kind of natural. She has a cool greenhouse showing, yeah, just showing how it works. It's helpful that the ones, the celebs we've collabed with, I don't, I, I know them, but I don't know, like I'm not connected to them in a parasocial relationship type of way. Like if I was to do Tony Hawk's backyard, I'd probably like freak out, you know, but Carrie Underwood or Kehlani, I like their music. I, I'm not some crazy super fan in that way, which I think is very helpful when you're making the content. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, like Carrie Underwood, I would just, I don't even know any of her songs. Yeah, you'd know him if you heard him though. Yeah, I'd be like, oh, it's cool to meet you. Like, it, you know, you're a creator, you, you're an artist. Like we have, you know, similar things that we're into. Like we understand, you, get, you have to like tap into consumer psychology, give people what they want. Yeah, weirdly, we've done a lot of musicians. And so there, to me, I find something very fascinating about like a hyper successful musician is that's just crazy distribution. If you think about, there, it's a piece of media that has, and I'm like, Okay, what is what, what's different about this person? So I'm sort of always kind of analyzing them at the same time that I that I'm working with them, trying to like suck up some little tidbit. A lot of people forget, like you know, quote unquote, like celebrities or like the A list talent, the people that we all know. Like they are, it's not just luck, right? Like they they were probably very intentional and very smart, and they probably had some things that they really cracked and figured out before anyone else did, and maybe no one else has figured it out yet. It's just like different secrets that they know. Like they're, they're entrepreneurs at the end of the day. I grew up playing music. I play piano, play guitar and I sing, but I sing by myself. Like no one hears me sing. And so we're, we're in the greenhouse with Carrie and I, I really wanted to know cause she's widely considered to have one of the best voices regardless of genre. So the range, the quality, the accuracy of tone, all that kind of stuff. I did some research. I was like, there's, musicians from all different genres saying like she has one of the craziest voices ever. And so I, I wanted to ask her if I s practiced, like if I had the perfect regime and I don't have some sort of vocal defect, right? How good could I actually get at singing? Could I become at your level or is there some level of like the genetic structure of your vocal cords or the way that you, you know, whatever. And not to say she doesn't work hard. She works incredibly hard, actually one of the hardest working people I've met, but she did sort of she did sort of look confused when I asked her that because I think there's a level of innate sort of gift she she has for for music where it almost didn't compute that I would be asking something like that. Sometimes with, with someone like that, it's just 
they're so, so good and they work so hard that it's they're so far beyond what you could ever be as a normie. You, you just can't, it, it doesn't make sense. So that blog strategy we've repeated again at a bigger scale. We purchased a friend's blog who had grown, I think he'd almost rivaled our traffic inside of a year. And so I was like, okay, look, this guy is like speaking to a question on hiring. He's like, well, he's better than we've ever been. So let's go ahead and, and strike a deal with him. We brought him on. He runs all of our written content at Epic now. And we've slowly over the last three, four months, we folded all of his content into the Epic site and doubled traffic. Uh, and not only that, the way that we monetize the blog directly is with ad revenue. And with the doubled traffic, we actually moved up a tier in our ad structure. So we got a higher cut of the revenue we were generating. And so not only is your traffic doubled, which would linearly double your earnings, we actually doubled by way of it was like a double double basically our ad rev quadrupled by buying a blog that doubled our traffic right and so that was a scaled up version of of the smaller little baby acquisition i did back in the day is there a framework you have for thinking through some of these acquisitions like if i'm yeah you know let's say i'm like the kevin of 2017 or something or whatever like i've never done this before but i probably could do it how should i approach it doing like a kind of my first acquisition or first couple like what are things to keep in mind so this is this is my way. I, I don't think it's sophisticated. So my way is, is there one good reason? Like, is there one compelling reason to do it? So take the blog. Well, the compelling reason is just that strict math, right? Whether it's a small acquisition or the large one, the strict math is that the payback period on the investment is, is relatively quick. But what I try to find is, I go, if there's a compelling sort of first order reason, can I craft like five to seven second order reasons that that kind of makes sense that are semi high probability? Like, you know, by by way of increasing traffic, do I then have increased flow through traffic to the store? Or do I then have increased flow through traffic to to our YouTube channel? Or by way of hiring, let's say Jason, who is the guy we bought the blog from, do I then increase the overall cadence of my own blog's output? Thus, increasing the sort of velocity of my growth on my own blog, even if the first order effect didn't happen, right? So if I can craft enough of those and the price point makes sense, then I just, if it was up to me, which is, it's not always, we, we like to run it through a process here and there's very smart people, but if it's up to me, I would just say, YOLO, let's do it because it doesn't, the, the price doesn't matter at that point because the all those stacking probabilities basically like guarantee that it's gonna work out. And look, I've only done this like three times, so, Maybe this diligence methodology is not really that sophisticated, but so so far it's worked, right? We did this with a physical product as well. This is one that's our it's our seed trade line. So we have like ten or twelve SKU line now. I I saw the trays from a friend of mine. I started offering them on my store, and they became quickly like ninety five percent of all of the sales of that tray line were were coming from our store. And so I went to him and I said, look, like why don't you just join the team? Like we can develop more, more trays because there's, there's an appetite for it. And you know, that, that acquisition or investment, if you want to call it that, I think it was maybe 18 months ago now, maybe a little bit more. It's returned like five or six X the purchase price, but not only that, like, and that, so that's like the table stakes of, of what an investment should do, I guess. But uh, think about the second order. Like we knew we were doing a big acquisition with a seed company. And so now I have a thing I can actually offer to, to wholesale that's not seats that we actually own. So our economics are really good. So like it, I don't know how to describe it. It's very fuzzy in my head, but you, you sort of see all these like chain chains of events that could happen. And if enough of them line up in in the positive sense, it, something sort of clicks in my head and I go, okay, this, this one makes sense. That's the best way I could describe it. If I were to like restate it to you and try to synthesize, it would be the spreadsheet, the numbers, Make sure that it lines up and it makes sense. But then also there are almost like adjacent qualitative things that maybe you could quantitate, like maybe they can't quite be measured in the spreadsheet, but there's like ancillary benefits of like to the point of, well, it'll probably increase traffic on the YouTube account from the cross running. We don't actually know, but it's probably there. So if you have enough of these kind of like second, third order effect type of things, it's like, all right, don't know how to quantify them, but they're, it's probably good enough that like, it will add some kind of extra benefit that we we just don't know. So we would quantify to be clear, like we do the initial sort of spreadsheet math and we'd, we'd have these adjacencies and I would always just cut them. I'd, I'd say, what do I think it is? Like 50% boost to store traffic or something. I'd be like, let's just call it 10%. Let's just say it's 10% and let's say the conversion rate's half because the traffic's colder. 
So it's like super conservative. And then I try to pencil, like I say, okay, let's, let's even say the AOV of that lower conversion is even lower. Okay. Well, that's still like 250 K extra a year. Well, the purchase price is X, you know, four times that or something. It's like just that adjacency being crazy conservative makes sense. And so I just try to find things like that. And they tend to be on the smaller side um, than, than these like things where you're running a banking process and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that generally seems if there's some kind of like middleman or whatever, they're optimizing the, the price, the final price that's paid, which is, you know, there's there's reasons that you should do that. But as a buyer, you probably want an inefficient process <laughs> as much as you can. And as a seller, you want an efficient process. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is awesome. Thanks for taking the time to come on. This is really fun. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning in to this conversation with Kevin Espiritu, founder and CEO of Epic Gardening. If you don't want to miss future episodes, subscribe to my newsletter, The Split, in the show notes, and you'll get new episodes plus transcripts in your inbox. If you want to support the show, share this episode with your friend who started a garden during COVID. You're probably already familiar with Kevin, and they'll probably like hearing his story. If you're on YouTube and want more content on starting media-driven businesses, you'll see two tappable boxes to watch prior episodes of the show. Similar to this conversation, we go deep on how they started and scaled their firms and all the tactics and lessons they learned along the way. Thanks again to Kevin for coming on, to Atio for supporting the show, and to you for listening. I hope you enjoyed. See you in the next episode.